Hello, everyone. Hi. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a mic on, so I think you can hear me. Yes, me too, hopefully. Mostly yeah. her. I mean, I'll just sort of whisper the questions. So um, if you hear a fart. <laughs> We're just starting there. All right. That's... <laughs> Um, I was thinking as I was preparing tonight, we sort of hit, in terms of Times Talks, I mean, we're pretty lucky. This is sort of peak Times Talk. I mean, you don't get much better than an hour. And the people uh, were apparently so foolish and so stupid <laughs> that they, ha they were goats, you know, they were as idiotic as goats. And we pride so. ourselves here in New York. <laughs> so, um, but in fact, it was a clever ploy by the people of Gotham to pretend to be as mad as goats because they didn't want to pay their taxes. <laughs> So they thought if they be behaved in a completely do-lally way, you know, <laughs> King John wouldn't come down with all his, um, you know, all his, um, his army upon them and, um, and claim taxes. So, um, so that's where Gotham, <laughs> Gotham comes from. Didn't start with Batman. Yeah, but then um, Washington <laughs> Berlin uh, found the name and, and, uh, <laughs> and used it in a satirical piece of writing. And then I had another question, and since this is a BAFTA co-sponsored event, people might also know this. In 2002, you, you, were, you became a dame? Mm -hmm. Were you damed? Like, I was like, damed or damned, whichever way you like it. <laughs> so here, I think of Dame Edna, and then I think of dames from Guys and Dolls, but that's not it at all. It's, um, mean, are you sort of royalty? It's the same no, as being a knight. No, it's nothing like royalty. Is nothing, it like being no. knighted? It's like being royalty. knighted. It's yeah. the female version of being knighted. So a dame in shining armor. Sir Lawrence Olivier or Sir you know, mm. um, Callan. Um, but it's nothing to do with royalty or aristocracy or, or anything like that. Mm. It's like your con Congressional Medal of Honor. Right. It's, a, it's an honoring by your country to say jolly well done, you know, excellent work, you know, keep it up sort of thing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so... Um, Too bad you didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you were saying, you know, to prep, I read your book. It was marvelous. And you were saying it was one of the things that you really wished your mom was there to see because, um, you know, your family background was working class. And on my mother's side. On yes. your mother's side. Yeah. But on your father's side, um, your grandfather was part of the Tsarist army. He was. In yes. Russia. Yes. And just happened to be in Britain when the revolution happened. Yes. Could you t t talk a little yes, bit Yes, he was sent. He'd been sent with one other um, representative by the Tsar to make an arms deal with the British government because uh, the Russians had just fought the Russo-Japanese War and had found, realized that they were incredibly under-armed, that you know, they had no armaments. They were, um, so um, at that time, Britain and, um, and England had a very close, Britain, Britain, sorry, Britain and Russia, and Russia had a very close relationship. You know, the Tsarina was the, uh, one of uh, Queen Victoria's granddaughters, I think. Um, and so, so, you know, there, were, there was a close relationship. So my grandfather, along with another um, person, was sent to do an arms deal with the British government to try and rearm Russia. 1916. Yeah, just before the Ru Russian Revolution. And it took longer than they thought it was going to take. So he brought his wife and his young son, my father, who was two. He, my father was born in Russia. Mm. But he brought his uh, wife and his young son over. And... Um, and basically, the revolution took place. You know, there had been <coughs> a series of revolutions before the major Bolshevik revolution, which had always been crushed or, or, or um, you know, had, had dribbled away to nothing. So my f grandfather, being a rather um, narrow-minded military man, was convinced that the Bolshevik revolution would never hold. Mm. So he thought, oh, it'll all be over in six months, you know. But then, of course, it wasn't. And he, he could never go back. So he left um, six sisters in Russia um, and his mother and, uh, and never saw them again. But it saved his life? But it saved his life, I'm and sure. And you're probably yes. your father's, perhaps? And prob uh, maybe my father's. It, it was, it, actually, it was quite extraordinary. I was convinced that um, my, uh, my great aunts, my, my grandfather's uh, sisters, must... I, I thought they had to have been destroyed 
uh, in the Stalinist era because they were just perfect candidates for mm -hmm. the Gulag. You know, they were intellectuals. They were originally middle class. They had a relative living abroad. <laughs> that relative had been in the Tsarist army. You know, they were just perfect candidates for the Gulag. But somehow, they escaped mm. um, Stalin. So. Mm. Um, in fact, uh, they all survived, more or less, mm -hmm. with, obviously with huge difficulty, but survived. And your, your grandfather was a taxi driver, and then your father became a taxi driver Yes, as well. my grandfathers, as so many immigrants do, right. who have no... Um, you know, my, my grandfather's sort of trajectory in, in Britain was sort of like this, <laughs> you know. He started off living in great comfort in the Russian embassy, in, in London, which was very, very uh, glamorous then, you know. Um, and then, of course, uh, the embassy had to close because there was no more uh, r relationship. And he had no way of making money. He didn't yeah. speak English. Um, and what he did do to his credit was he never pillaged the money that the Tsar had put in, put in the bank for him and this other gentleman to access. Mm. They, they were the only signatories to a very, very large sum of money to pay for the arms. Oh. And um, he refused to, um, to basically steal the money, which mm. he could have done, but mm. he absolutely refused to do that. That would have been a betrayal of his, um, of his nationality and his, his uh, uh, Tsarist loyalties. Mm. So, um, so he finished up having to basically, yeah, drive a taxi. Mm. And then my dad became a taxi driver too, yeah. And your dad was also a socialist as well? Yes, my father became a, a, a left-wing socialist, mm -hmm. um, or a communist, I would say, probably. I don't know if he actually joined the Communist Party, so it's interesting for me to do Trumbo, the film of Trumbo, because Trumbo was my father in, in many ways. Mm. Um, he was certainly a sympathizer. Um, he might have joined the Communist Party, he might not, but he certainly was, um, there was a famous moment in uh, British London history just before the Second World War when Oswald M Mosley, who was the um, London fascist, uh, leader of the London fascist party, as I'm sure many of you know, there was quite a strong fascist movement in, in Europe and, and in London before the Second World War. And, and then there was a great uh, movement against it as well, mm. fight against it. And the people who were fighting against fascism were basically the left-wing socialists and the communists. Mm. So um, there was this famous march that uh, Oswald Mosley and his fascist black shirts took through the East End of London because the East End of London at that time was where the Jewish community lived. The immigrant Jewish commu community was based in the East End of London, so the fascists were deliberately walking through um, that part of London um, to show their um, aggression and their, mm. and, their, and, and their violence. And and my father, and it became known as the Battle of Cable Street because the the left wing socialists rose up against this and went to sort of confront mm. them. And um, my father was one of those people mm. in, at the Battle of Cable Street, so I'm very proud of that fact. And do you, do you sort of carry that with mm. you? And I was wondering, you know, the idea, you said when you played the Queen, you sort of had this like, sort of anarchy in the UK attitude toward the Queen when you were younger, but that really shifted the more you got to know and really think about Yes, her absolutely. As a I mean, my parents um, certainly softened, and I think with the realize my mother was never really. As, as left wing or as political as my father was, um, you know, she was a, an East End girl. She was a working class woman from, again, the East End of London, uh, old old London family. So she was a very different sort of kettle of fish. But she, she was a vegetarian, sort of ahead years ahead of. Uh, she her was, time. yes, she her was. Granddad that's was right. A, her father was a butcher, but yes. she was sort of horrified yes, I, at the whole process. Yes, that's what she was. <laughs> yes, she was horrified by <laughs> the killing of animals, basically. Um, but um, uh, where was I? What was I talking about? I've forgotten. Um, what anyone? was I talking about? Well, <laughs> I should really. Well, yeah. we'll something else. But yeah. one of the things. Oh, my mum. Oh, yes, yeah, so politics. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yes, exactly. So when. Thank you. <laughs> so when the realization of what had happened under Stalin, with you know, that was a terrible moment for a lot of of the people who were believing in the 
utopia and the beautiful idealism of right. communism. It's such a beautiful idea. And of course, the reality was so absolutely horrific. And the realization of the loss of that dream and the loss of that uh, utop utopian idealism of how beautiful the world could be, mm. um, I think was, a, was, a, was very painful for my father's generation. Um, but I was brought up in a very, I'm getting round to the Queen, I was brought up in a very anti-monarchist um, household. Mm. Both my mum and my dad really, really thought it was a load of old rubbish, you know, the monarchy. <laughs> And it was silly to, and I, you know, they've got a point. <laughs> you know, why, what, what's it for, really? Um, what's it all about? Um, so I'd, I'd uh, grown up with that, those sort of attitudes, but yes, yeah, certainly playing the queen and making me, forcing myself to enter into who this person is and really come to a realization of what she'd done with mm. her life and the way in which she'd done it. I found a huge admiration for her growing in me um, that actually became a love. I would say, it, you know, it became a kind of a love, and I, I still feel that, you know. See, she had no vanity, you know. She no vanity, no vanity very at dutiful, all. Not absolutely not the Hollywood queen sort of throwing no, around smiles. No, and, and and maybe a, a lost, a, maybe we'll never see that kind of attitude, that that kind of person again, because with our um, love of celebrity and the constant voraciousness of the, of the press and the media. Um, they are sort of the ultimate movie stars, you know, mm. the, these um, people, and they are hunted in the same way as we saw, obviously, with Diana. But, um, the, you know, the Queen never played that. She never played the celebrity. It was always about her work, what she had to do, just doing it. In her ideal world, she would never have done that. That's the other thing. She wasn't, she would have been a country woman, you know, mm -hmm. living on a farm, mm -hmm. as I said in the play The Audience. Um, that's what she would have done. Mm -hmm. um, your devotion towards your career was something that, or, or your passion was instilled early by your mother, too, again, ahead of her time. Mm. She was just sort of very worried that you would succumb to romance, get married, sort of get locked in that. And that was never, ever your ambition, which was also your, ahead of your time as well. Was this always yes, something was. you knew and carried with you? Yes, I mean, I think we, we are all the products of our, our, our parents. Um, and I was the product of two, of two people, both who really believed in women uh, being financially independent right. and really believed that we should um, not just as women, but as people, be financially independent. You know, they grew up um, <clears throat> in their youth when they were young uh, in London. It was a depression. They had to go through those terrible days. Then they went through the Second World War. Then they went through the post Second World War. So their whole youth, that whole th twenty years of their of their youth from twenty to forty, was very, very difficult physically financially, just really, really tough. Mm. So um, to have financial independence was all important to mm. them. And they wanted my, my sister and I to be teachers. And I did actually train as a teacher. Um, my sister became a teacher and was a wonderful teacher her whole life. Um, but that was sort of not, my, not what I wanted to do, right. honestly. And mm -hmm. do you, you, the germ of where you, where your influence of knowing that you wanted to act, it's, is it sort of a fuzzy origin story of sorts for you? Um, it was a sort of a rather sort of uncomfortable mix of unbelievable vanity. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, oh, they're all looking at me, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but there, you're not completely comfortable with it, right? There's sort of no, a and, and a righteous love of literature and storytelling and the world of the imagination. And really, um, so it was a combination of those two things. But um, I, my very first role, which I remember to this day, I had no lines, which is always a very good thing, incidentally, not to have any lines. <laughs> but I had a gorgeous costume. <laughs> good combination. Um, I was playing the Virgin Mary. <laughs> the 
Do that come naturally? Uh, you were six. I, was, I was six. Yes, I was six. <laughs> I do remember my costume. It was all it was blue with stars on. It was mm. so gorgeous. Mm. And I was so good at, you know, playing the Virgin Mary. I was taken around from, from classroom to classroom to sort of sit and and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But the other thing, uh, the other thing, we, we had a, I grew up in the um, British equivalent of Coney Island, you know, uh, South End on Sea. It's, it's a place where the East Enders, the working class people of London, go for their day trips, you know, to get drunk, throw up, <laughs> have a fight, and go home. You know, that's all. Oh, that was a great night out. Fabulous. Um, fish and chips, you know, that sort of place. And we had a pier the longest pier in the world. It's a mile and a quarter long. And um, South End Pier. And at the end of the pier, when I was growing up, they had literally had shows at the end mm. of the pier. Mm. You know, summer shows. Um, my parents took me to this summer show, and it was a variety sort of show with a comedian and a singer. And, uh, and the comedian was very funny, and I fell off my seat, I remember laughing. And then the dancing girls came on, and again, they had blue floaty things on and I just absolutely was mesmerized. I thought it was just the most beautiful, wonderful thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I guess then I was about six or seven. And then jump forward, my, my mother took me to an amateur production of um, Hamlet when I was about 12 or 13 and it's the perfect age to see Hamlet, never having seen it before, not knowing that Ophelia goes mad or that Hamlet's going to die, or not knowing the story. You know, imagine watching Hamlet not knowing what happens in the end. It's like, it's, it's such an incredible sort of thriller as much as anything. Um, and it was a very, very, um, you know, rough uh, um, amateur production. But I just was absolutely transported by it. And that world of... The Gravedigger and Gertrude and, and Horatio and, and, and that amazing world was just so, so exciting and that incredible poetry, mm. most of which I didn't understand a word of, but I sort of grasped that it was something fantastic. And it sent me to Shakespeare and I went home and, and we had this one of those huge books of Shakespeare, you know, I don't know if any, any of you ever have had one of those, but where the print's like this small, you know, the complete works of Shakespeare in one book. And I went to that book and I just started looking through it and reading, finding all these amazing characters and amazing scenes. Mm. And you had a teacher who was a champion of you, right, for the, to get to the National? Yes, the National Youth Theatre, which was the thing that really launched me because I didn't go to drama school. I, I went to a teacher's training college. Um, but there was this organised... I couldn't afford to go to drama school. It was just financially impossible. Well, my your parents, parents being, you know, uh, the means they were, was this a terrific sort of battle in the house for it to, get, to allow you to go? To Not to the Youth Theatre. I, I auditioned secretly. But once I got in, it was something you did in the summer holidays, so it didn't cost them anything, and uh, it didn't cost me anything in terms of my education. So it was fine, but that, that was absolutely fine. And it was actually what launched me uh, mm. professionally. Mm. It, I was very lucky. On that, if we, we have, there's a lovely uh, compilation, if we could sort of uh, roll it now, that the Gothams put together last night of... The, your career, so if we can... My film career, not... Yeah, film career. Stage not there. the theatre. No, they like, so oh, okay. oh, that's boring. <laughs> so if we could, can we set that up while we're... Yeah. we're going to happen? Hmm. It should be happening. I have to do what I can to keep these memories alive. Because people forget, you see. Especially the young. Turn a bit. Now the other way. It's the dress. Take it off. Desire. And regret. Knowledge. And oblivion. Love. Oh yes. <laughs> I feel 
felt like a pain. I feel it and I hold on to it because it's up to me to find the man that destroyed that life. My heart still runs on you, I swear it. Be off before I hang you, I'm minded to hang you now, with my own hand too. Yes. Get out of my sight! than good I'm the best I'm the perfect servant I know when they'll be hungry and the food is ready I know when they'll be tired and the bed is turned down I know it before they know it themselves foolishly I believe that was what the people wanted from their Queen not to make a fuss nor wear one's heart on one's sleeve duty first self second oh god this is unbearable no wonder I feel lonely I'm surrounded by morons <laughs> I am fond of you. Some of my happiest years were spent on this lot. Not in your office, of course. You were always trying to fuck me on the couch. Me trying to maintain my virtue. <laughs> Barely. But times change. Now I'd happily fuck you. We're looking to present the uh, collateral damage in the street in this area right here as 45 to 50 percent fatality. Do you, do you think that's possible? I've calculated as 65 to 75. You just do whatever you can to save this girl's life. My dear, even if we go no further, we made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And that's quite a long way for an Austrian girl like me. see those do you sort of feel pride do you get self-critical about the performances have you sort of seen oh, it's always nice to see those little compilations because it's um you know it's always the best bits <laughs> <laughs> and they're all uh, it's always quite fun i i like all, all movie compilations mm. actually it always makes me kind of fall in love with movies all mm. over again um but um there are a couple of performances out and not in that compilation that, that actually I count amongst my best performances Which on one? film. Um, one was Ayn Rand mm. that I did for Showtime. I, actually, they were both for Showtime television. Um, Ayn Rand and uh, The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone, mm. uh, which I think were both, were, from my perspective, you know, uh, amongst my best performances. Mm. Um, last night, introducing Robert De Niro introduced Helen last night, and he just went there. I don't know if anyone saw this. He said, "The Queen wasn't my idea of a royal milf." <laughs> <laughs> that is until I saw Helen Mirren play the Queen, <laughs> and then he sort of went along in that vein before conceding, "I know I'm on the edge of creepiness here." <laughs> And, you know, this is something that throughout your career from the very beginning, you know, your physicality, how do you feel about your physicality? The infamous 1970s television interview where you were in front of the camera and the presenter asked you, how can you be a serious actor with, and then he would just, he stared directly at your breasts. And so for something like, <laughs> is it sort of okay because Bob De Niro, she called him Bob, I, I would never. <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> but coming from him, um, or does it just feel different now because you know you're not as pre you, there's not a sensation of being preyed upon as, or sort of subjected to sexism at a time where you said he, the word hadn't even been exist hadn't come into existence when you first started acting. No, I, I mean I think there's a huge difference between someone being funny in a presentation and someone being interviewing you I, right. I, I think there's a sort of ma a huge difference there and, and um, um, it was also the very first talk show I'd ever done in my life you know I, I was incredibly nervous um, and, were you but, and it was uh, very much of its era as well right. you know it wasn't so surprising to it it's become right. surprising right. at the time nobody sort of thought twice about it did you think I did yes. yes I did of course yes I did that was yeah. kind of uh, 
you know, I, I was a little confused. I, it, when I look at it now, and you can, I, I, one can see it, um, I was amazed how well I handled it. Right. I thought I handled it actually extremely well with um, you know, humor necessary and, um, and sort of grace. grace. Um, but uh, poor Michael Parkinson, that's the name of the, um, <laughs> of the interviewer. He's never lived it down. Yeah. Good, yeah. huh? Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Took a long time coming, but you know. <laughs> um, and, y and you really do, you're, you know, the Saturday Night Live magic bosom sketch. Oh, yeah, Have you seen yeah. it? It's amazing. It's like, very funny. Can you describe what happens in the sketch? Well, in the sketch, I'm, I'm and I did, I was appearing on Saturday Night Live, and it was one of the girls' ideas. That the, so it was very female. It was a female thing. Um, and it's, it's the, the girls of Saturday Night Live, if they're feeling confused or upset or tired or, or depressed about anything, they come and knock on my dressing room door and say, can I? And I'll say, yes, of course you can. And they come and bury their heads in my bosom like this. <laughs> and they go, oh, I feel so much better. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was absolutely lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, this, you recently made headlines when you know, Helen Mirren declared she will no longer do nudity. I mean, mm. you know, which is, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I, I never like to say never, you know, because it always, it will always come back and bite you in the bum if you do. But, you know, um, hopefully never again. Right. <laughs> Let's right. put it that way. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, your sort of the, the, the definitive role, perhaps, in your career, one around which everything pivoted, was as um, Jane Tennyson, of yes, course. Yes, yes, that was and, important for me. And mm. um, you were told at one time, I think, when you were young, that you wouldn't, you'd be successful, but not until the age of 45. Was this, I mean, is that a true story? Like you said? That is a true story, absolutely. I went to, you know, when, I think the early 20s is a very difficult time for people in general, men and women. Um, because you know you're just war you're just entering into the world and and you just you have no idea what's and, and the realities of the world suddenly come crashing in upon you, the need to you know apply for a driving license and to have car insurance and to pay the electricity bill and and all those you know that those that the practicalities of life and then realizing the responsibility of all that and are you ever going to make enough money are you going to be able to you know is it going to work for you mm. I, uh, and relationships and i think it's a very difficult time the early 20s so i'm in london i'm in i'm 22 23 24 i guess just starting out on my career and and, and afraid and um nervous and um so i decided to go to a a, a palm reader. I was told of this guy who lived in north of London and that he was apparently a very good palm reader. I mean, I'm so not into this sort of thing, incidentally, <laughs> at all. I d just, you know, not at all. I, I don't look astrology or any of that stuff. I'm just not interested. Um, you went to but I went to therapy. this. Yeah, oh, yes, exactly. I went to, yeah, therapist. I think I tried the therapist before I went to the palm reader, actually. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, uh, but anyway, th th that didn't work, so I went to the palm reader, and um, he um, he said, now, take a, uh, here's some paper and pencil, write everything down, because you'll forget what I say, and I will speak very quickly. And he started, and, and he was absolutely right. It was like, I, I, I couldn't remember, but I was writing it all down. But the one thing that stuck in my mind was you'll be successful, you'll have a very successful life, but you won't really hit your stride or your big success won't come until you're in your 40s. Well, you don't want to hear that when you're 23, you know. <laughs> it's like, what? You mean not next week? <laughs> no, I can't wait till I'm 40. Um, uh, and um, when I came out of that thing and I had this pile of paper, this this deep and all with my writing on it and I looked at it and I didn't I couldn't remember what was in it what was he said apart from that one thing I couldn't remember anything else and I looked at it and I thought you know what I don't want to know and I went to the nearest rubbish thing and I threw it away mm. and from that moment on I felt great about life mm. I thought you know what it's an adventure you just have to take the adventure I absolutely don't want to know what's going to happen mm. 
Um, but I did remember that one thing. And you know what? He was right about that. It's, a, it's mm. uncanny. Yeah. And Jane was such a wonderful role. I mean, and had you said, I think, you, had you ever come across sort of a role as fully fledged? Is that like a, a real woman? No, it was a great edges? role. Yeah. It was an absolutely great role. And, and um, at the time, you know, now it's very, very common that you have women leading TV series. At that time, it was unheard of. You had had Cagney and Lacey, but that was a duo. Um, but um, apart from Cagney and Lacey, I don't think there was any other TV series ever run, led by a single woman. Mm. And, um, and so the TV company were very nervous about whether it would work or not, mm. you know. Um, so when they put it to me, they said, we'll do one, and then if it's successful, we'll do three more. Um, but we won't know. We won't be able to tell you until we know whether the one has worked or not. Um, and of course, it, it worked spectacularly well. Mm. It, was, uh, it was a great piece of work, a great character um, devised by Linda LaPlante and um, beautifully shot. And uh, yes, it, it was, it was I was so lucky with that role um, because it allowed me to step away from, you know, that sort of girl that you saw up there. Um, what do you mean, that girl we saw up there? Well, you know, the, the, the girlfriendy girl sort of thing, role, you know, that were really the only roles around and still are, to a certain extent, for young women, the girlfriendy roles or the young wifey roles, you know. Um, it allowed me to be the age I was. That was the great thing. I could be the 40-year-old that I was. Um, and look the way I looked, and not have to, you know, pretend to look any other way than I actually looked, and and it allowed me to get into the next, you know, era of mm. my professional life. So many, um, the sort of story of Hollywood is, you know, when you hit a certain age, you run out of film roles. That it's become slim pickings. You're the mom, then you're the grandmother. But it seems like you have just had this bountiful. I mean, obviously completely, you know, thank God for all of us that you have, but did you ever come across that, that a dearth of roles uh, after Jane Tennyson, or did it just sort of open no, up No, I didn't, no. It was the opposite, actually, yeah. honestly. My roles became much more interesting after I hit 40 than they were before. Mm. And I think that's still the case now. If you're lucky enough, if you can manage to sort of hang on in there. Um, what I did, and I, I think it was... Um, uh, helpful was a every four years I'd go back at least three or four years I'd go back to the theatre because mm. I started off in the theatre theatre was my my love and my ambition what really was in the theatre and um, and I made made sure that I always go back went back to the theatre and I think that sort of um, just helped deepen the whole, my whole career, I, I, somehow, and, and made people think of me in a certain way mm. as well. Um, there is such a resolve and strength in each of your characters, you know, and is it something that has come natural to you in a way? This just, this presence, this determination, this quiet ferocity. I like that, quiet ferocity is very nice, I like that, but um, no, the, you know, the, as people will always say, the, the interesting thing in, in any role uh, is the complexity of the character, and, and the complexity always comes through their weaknesses. Mm. So a, what you might call a strong role is actually a role that's full of weakness and vulnerabilities and, and ambivalence. Those are the best roles. Mm. It's a strong role. You know, it's boring. Right. Um, you, you want... We, we, you know, we're all um, vulnerable, complex, insecure people, all of us. And, right. and you know, you want to, that's our job as actors, is to reflect the nature of humanity. Um, so you want that to be as complex as possible. 
And in the, this year, you've had three, I think, three, four films that you've worked on this year, the two that have been released, um, Woman in Gold with Maria Altman. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. There's a Jewish-Austrian woman trying to reclaim a famous Klimt painting that had been stolen from her. And then Hedda Hopper in Trumbo, and she was just, oh, you know, you were so she good was a strong at woman. being vicious. And yeah. <laughs> she was a very strong so woman. She was an incredibly powerful woman. Yes. And so absolutely 100% resolved that she was right. Um, and is it difficult playing if, say, perhaps on a personal level, you might disagree with the character? Is there a conflict in you to fully flesh the character out? Or do, do you have to think, what are the motivations? What are the, where? Yes, I, you know, obviously I had to study Hedda. I, I knew quite a lot about her already, but I, I tried to penetrate into that mind, you know. Um, quite difficult to do that because I think she was very, very, because of her job and the way she operated, she was seemed to be very, very guarded. I, I read the book that her son wrote about her. Um, but it was difficult to get into, into that mind. Um, I had a theory that she was, she'd been sexually abused when she was young, and that had made her sort of cut down, uh, closed down. I don't mean necessarily by, you know, a, a, as a child, but, but I, I certainly think when she, when she came to New York as a young actress, mm. um, I think she probably had to put up with a lot of crap from men, you know, a lot. And uh, I think it made her tough in some way. Mm. Um, and angry. And angry, yeah, yes. She called her house the house that fear built. So she was very conscious of what she was capable of doing. Mm and absolutely ruthless in doing it if she felt she needed to. It, it, it was a mentality that I find very, very difficult to kind of come, come to grips with, actually. Because there's no soft, there's no, it doesn't no, look there's quite no, human. No, it, it, no, and, and I do recognize that that is a human trait. You know, it, there are people who have that uh, single-mindedness um, and, and uh, and ability to be absolutely ruthless with it. Um, I'm not like that, um, so I, it's hard to get into that. Mm. I mean, there was a scene in Trumbo that was cut that I liked, and, uh, and it sort of explained Hedda to a certain extent, and that's a scene when she, because her son did fight in the Korean War, um, and there's a soldier who's had his arm, lost his arm in the war and comes up to Hedda at one of those functions and says, Miss Hopper, I just want to thank you for what you're doing for America. Mm. You know, we're, we are in the armed services are, are right behind you. And that was a truth mm. about America at mm. that time. Mm. Um, and, and it made, it, at least it put Hedda into the historical context that she was in. Um, but, um, but on also, uh, you know, a, an incredibly fun character to play because she, she is so incredibly fierce and, and absolutely ruthless. And a product of, you know, those sort of old, wonderful uh, 1940s film, like, you know, His Girl Friday, where just the, you know, the yes, reports are yes. right there on him. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they knew they were wordsmiths, those people. They did, they did love words. They used words very well. How, how do you pick your roles? Um, with great trepidation and, and difficulty, honestly, it's always, a, that's a hard moment. Um, uh, it, it's very much to do with who, the, who are the people. Well, theatre is different, you know, obviously. Picking roles in theatre is, is a different experience, but um, the director is incredibly important, the, the co-actors are very important. Does the character appear on the last page of the script? Very important. <laughs> um, and, uh, and is it sufficiently different from the last thing I did? Because that's a, that's a battle you always have, you know. So if you're good at something, there was one you to do it again. You don't play Elizabeth once. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've played her twice, actually. Right. Three times. Right. Twice, in, you know, in the theatre. 
Well, um, I was with the audience, which you won a Tony for, um, playing Elizabeth II. You uh, had a resistance to playing her again, but it was almost like you couldn't say no, right? Was that I it? couldn't or say no. I it was couldn't. all of the, your favorite, amongst your favorite people. Absolutely. And the play was so brilliant. The yeah. play was so great. No, I went to the read-through absolutely determined to say at the end of the read-through. I asked if we could do a reading of the play before we, you know, committed to anything. And I went to the read-through thinking, I, I'm going to do the read-through and then I'm going to say, I'm really sorry, but I don't think this is the right thing for me. I, I can't do this again. Um, and, and her character, you were on stage for the, almost the For two hours, yes, yeah. non-stop, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I walked in and there was this amazing team of pe people, theatre people, which you guys won't, won't probably know, but you know, Peter Morgan, the writer, Stephen Daldry, the director, Bob Crowley, the produ uh, designer. One of your favourites. A well, oh, brilliant, brilliant designer. I mean, these, this was the cream of British theatre people. And I thought, and you're going to walk away from this? Are you mad? You know. So I knew uh, by the end of the read through, I was going to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great experience, it was. Were you able to sort of mine new parts of the character? Yes, it was a very, well, it was a very different piece, right, obviously. It, you know, it, it was amazing. You went from, you know, from the age of 50 to the age of 25 to the age of, you know, 60, 70, back to, you know, 33, and then off to 85. So, and quick, quick changes on the stage. I don't know if any of you saw it, but, um, oh, thank you, you did. Um, uh, you know, it, it was very, it was challenging. It was a wonderful challenge, uh, mm. acting-wise. Um, one of the, when, and when you played the Queen too, or were approached to do it on, on film, uh, I, you said somewhere like, this is just going to be a disaster of sorts, a complete embarrassment. I guess I have to do it. Which, <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah, that, was that what went through your mind? Like, oh, I'm sure, yes. Yeah. Because, oh, goodness me. Now it's sort of become, that, that film sort of opened the floodgates somewhat. And now, you know, films about everyone in the royal family and, you know, all of this stuff. But um, then it was, it had never been done before. And so... Uh, and so in Britain, yeah. you know, they, the British have such a sort of love, hate, not hate, but confused relationship with the royal family. They adore them, and yet they can't help but want to destroy them. So, so there's this terrible relationship, and anything to do with the royal family, if you to say anything about any member of the royal family, it gets blown up into a huge story, and it's in the newspaper. So, you know, it was a very, very um, intimidating thought mm. doing that film. Um, and I mm. loved, there's um, your description of, it, it premiered at Venice. Yes. And you went on stage, and there, it was just a rapturous reception, and you found yourself, right, throwing your arms out. Doing my Evita. Thinking, what the hell am I, what, am I doing no. Evita now? Like, I know, it's my husband. When he wants to bring me down, he always starts singing. Don't cry for me, Argentina. <laughs> no, I sort of did this. <laughs> and did that just sort of what happen? What are you doing unconsciously? Like? <laughs> I did. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's good. back to, you know, love, loving people applauding and looking at me and, oh. <laughs> no, I, actually, I didn't know what else to do because they just kept applauding, you know, so you, you didn't want to stand there and, it went on and on and on, so you know you have to give them something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you said it opened up all these parts for you. You know, one of the things we were just sort of chit-chatting backstage, and um, Carol, when she was mentioning the work I've done, I've looked into gender discrimination in Hollywood with the ACLU, and you said, oh "God, gender." And I thought, because mm -hmm. you've had to field all these questions. So, Helen, yeah. you know, yeah. how do well, you feel? It's a little bit. I, I'm so thrilled that finally it's in the conversation. Mm. Women have been having, trying to have this conversation for an awfully long time. Right. A very, very long time. And finally, the conversation is beginning to be heard and right. repeated in the media and, and talked about. I, I just hope it continues. Um, it's, it's, I, I can't believe how long it's taken. That, that's, that amazes me. Just to be a conversation, do, does it seem to you like a a, 
different, a markedly different or somewhat different environment for young actresses these days coming up in terms of yes. roles? And uh, I don't know about in terms of roles, but in terms of their expectation, definitely. Um, in terms of, obviously, the ways in which to express yourself, definitely. Um, you know, last night there were this wonderful young couple of girls who got an award for best best short series on on the internet. I mean, I had no idea really what they were talking about, but <laughs> you know, I guess they're little ten minute series on that you can find on the internet, and they won the best of those. You know, and so there are all these amazing venues for right. people mm. to do their own thing, which didn't exist then, and mm. and that's a great. Uh, um, uh, mouthpiece for women they there it is go ahead do it you can do whatever you like right another film that won last night at the Gotham Awards the Gotham Awards were the uh, was a film called Tangerine that was completely shot on an iPhone right so you know that's a very exciting thing that mm -hmm. we, we can now hear hear people's voices if they choose to put them out there. When I said in terms of roles, you just feel like the landscape is still a lot of girlfriends, a lot of wives, as far as you can see. Yes, yes. I mean, pulchritude, you know, is a beautiful thing. It's beautiful to look at beautiful faces. And when they're 50 feet high, not 50 feet, that's a complete exaggeration, Helen, <laughs> 12 feet high, um, uh, you know, it's wonderful to see a beautiful young face up there, male or female. And so, uh, film will always love beauty, and and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Um, I think what really pisses me off is when you you know you've got um, this woman who's supposed to be a you know a, a, an expert in in um, a, a, you know in in astronaut and you know neurology, it's, it's a, a neurology yeah. or something and. And she's 25. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's like really annoying. Um, or the but, age disparities too. I mean, those are between, you know, lovers on. Yes, yes. It, it, it used to be much worse, didn't it? And, and I think they're finally sort of the pennies dropping there, I think. Well, it's, they're being outed, but, you know, as Mike, Maggie Gyllenhaal famously said, you know, she's 37 and was told she was too old to play a 50-year-old's love interest. Um, yes, I know. Yeah, this, I that's mean, terrible, isn't it, really? Yeah. It's terrible. Well, I think Anne Bancroft, when she was the so-called older woman in... Um, graduate. Graduate, was like two years older than... Or maybe not even as old as, or not a lot older. It's only like a couple of years older than um, <clears throat> than um, Dustin Hoffman. Right. Some of you may, maybe will know the exact the exact you know um, situation. But I I know she wasn't much older, and I think uh, when Glenn Close played Gertrude, when Mel. Um, uh, Mel Gibson played Hamlet. I think she was younger than Mel Gibson was. Right. At least the same age, as you know. It's enraging, really. <coughs> it hasn't been something so much that you've had to face personally. And why do you think that is? At least, you know, in the, from your 40s on. Um... I, I don't know. I don't know. I, luck, uh, maybe. I mean, I'm sure I lost a lot of parts because I was too old, mm. probably, mm. you know. Uh, but I don't know about that, so, mm. you know. Um, I just uh, kind of get on with what I've, what's in front of me and do it as, well, as best I can. Mm. Um, well, start mm. thinking about questions because we're going to be opening it up in, in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, sorry, one of... Another thing I wanted to ask you, the transition from stage to camera, was that something when you first started being in front of camera, you, it was qu quite easy because you'd been on the no, stage? No, no, on the contrary. It, mm. was, it was really difficult. I felt, I felt like a, 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 I called it deer in the headlights, rabbit in the headlights kind of acting, sort of like <laughs> turnover action. <laughs> you know, like I, I had no idea what to do. And... Um, so poor John Borman, when we did Excalibur, you see a little bit of it there. 
Um, he had all of these actors, me, Liam Neeson, um, Gabriel Byrne, uh, none of us had done any film. So we were all complete, you know, idiots. We had no idea about what you're, how to do it, what you're supposed to do. Um, he was very patient with us, really. Um, and I'd done a lot of theatre, quite a lot of theatre by then. I was probably, you know, getting up towards my 30s, maybe. Um, and I suddenly realised I knew nothing about this format and I'd better start learning. So then I stopped doing theatre and whenever anything came up for television, anything in front of a camera, and I did do a lot of television, mm. um, I, I accepted it just to be able to learn. Mm. Uh, the biggest learning curve obviously was doing Prime Suspect because I did so, you know, I was on set for many, many hours, for many, many months. Um, so I learned a lot there. Mm. But when I, did, when I did Mosquito Coast with Peter Weir, I was still in my not quite knowing how to do it sort of thing. And, and it was amazing to watch Harrison, who was such a masterful movie star. He knew exactly what the frame was, how to do his head, what... He was, you know, this master technician. And I, wa I watched him trying to you know, understand. But then I thought, no, I'm going to go the other route. I'm going to just try and be as free as possible, which was with, with the result that I was never on camera. <laughs> I was always like, <laughs> being, <laughs> poor Peter Weir was like, Helen, get, get the shots over there. I was over there doing something very natural and real. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it drove him crazy. But it was all a part of the, you know, my, my personal learning mm -hmm. process. And was it different, too, um, interviewing in America versus Britain? I mean, I think you said in, Amer in America, they sort of, are you right for the part? It wasn't mm. almost like you were auditioning with acting, like you had to be right for the preconceived part. Yes, does that, that was still a shock feel to my system. Does that, my, that was a feel shock. like a difference? A um, little less now, I think, because people are more familiar with what I can do and mm. maybe the range of it or... Um, but yes, that was very weird to me that, because especially in theatre, you know, when you start rehearsals, you've got four weeks to go, five weeks, six weeks, to, and, and your performance is going to develop and change, and every day you're going to bring something new into it. And, um, and in film, you're supposed to arrive at your audition with your performance, and that's it, you do it. And then you go on the set, and they say, oh, yeah, we like that, that's good, let's have her. And then you go on the set and you do what, something else. And they go, well, why are you, what are you doing? Why, why aren't you doing what you did in the audition? They go, well, well, because that was just an audition. There's loads of other things to do, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I, thought you were, I thought you thought I was just a good actress, you know. So I'm, but no, they want what they saw, that mm. one thing. They're mm. buying that. Mm. So um, that was a bit of a shock. Mm. I didn't have to do much of that because I did actually didn't do a lot of auditioning, actually. Mm. And then right before we go to the questions, I hope you'll... You were talking last mm. night um, when you watched The Queen first with your husband. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, you know, these, The Queen wears dowdy, very practical clothes, and you're watching it. Can you share with us what you asked your husband? No, it was, it, it was at Venice, and neither of us... At the film festival, and neither of us had seen it. And at Venice, which is where I did my Evita thing, they do this embarrassing thing, you know, the audience is all there, and you and the filmmakers have to come and sit almost like on, a, on thrones, you know, but very exposed with no one in front of you or around you. So you're sitting there as the filmmakers, and at the end of the film, they all turn around and clap or boo, you know, so it's, it's quite intimidating. Um, and neither Taylor or I had seen the film, and the first shot of the film is me in the full regalia, the wig, but the full regalia, being painted, having her portrait painted. And the first shot of the film is me as the queen turning and looking straight down the camera, straight at the audience. We call it down the bottle, down the camera. You rarely do that in film. And uh, my husband, in the silence, respectful silence, everyone was watching the queen. My husband literally went, ah, ha, 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 like that. 
when you saw me dressed as a queen like this, so only person laughing really loudly. It was like, oh my God. So I leaned over and I said, darling, will you ever make love to me again? <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> All right.